hospital, not including the outpatient setting. And these errors were not only leading to deaths, but also permanent disabilities, extended hospital stays and recoveries, and all of these leading to additional treatments and additional cost. So any such report triggers a lot of wave, and the first ones to catch on were the payers, and the largest payers for healthcare in the US are the Fortune 500 companies with several of their employees. So they developed a coalition called the LeapFrog Group, and the LeapFrog Group was coming up with process improvements that can lead to significant reductions in medical errors happening in hospitals. And in fact, this also changed the paradigm where the Fortune 500 companies and several of the payers were coming up with purchasing strategies on how and where they were going to purchase healthcare purely based on the quality delivered in the hospitals. I'm not going to talk about the thousand page report from the LeapFrog group, but as a summary, they identified a, the top three things that could probably change healthcare and reduce the number of medical errors. And the number one was computerized physician order entry. Not a surprise because doctors have the best handwriting in the world and was contributing to a significant number of errors. The second one was evidence-based hospital referral. And what they said is any kind of elective, elective treatment should be guided by providers to hospitals which had documented better outcomes. And some of this data is now available on the internet. I mean, in Pennsylvania, you could find out which cardiothoracic surgeon operated on how many cases, what was the outcome, what was the length of stay, and everything. But if you don't have such outcome comparisons, they felt that the guidance should be based on the volume from the hospital. Well, one and two are important, but the third one is particularly important to an intensivist because the third thing that they identified as a priority in reducing medical errors was actually ICU physician staffing. Having qualified intensivists, having qualified critical care specialists in the ICU, and they were somewhat liberal about it. They said that as long as you have intensivists available during routine work hours, like from nine to five, and after hours is covered by what they called certified effectors, as long as people could understand the lingo of the intensivist and carry out the orders and the intensivist is available over phone or in whatever fashion, that they felt was reducing mortality and overall improving outcomes. Now, sh sure enough, the country responded to that, but there is a significant shortage of manpower in the U.S. And there was a report from Compaq's group which said that if the aging population continues the way the baby boomers are growing and if we have the same number of trained intensivists projected in the next 10 years, you wouldn't have enough critical care specialists to be managing. And it's already becoming true. Now, is that the same in India? Sure. We don't have standards, laws, and regulations as far as what should be an ICU. I mean, you would see the board of critical care unit in several hospitals, several nursing homes. Are they really critical care units? Some of them are primitive and probably non-existent, particularly as we move to remote India. And there's no particular grading of ICUs. We don't know what's a secondary ICU, what's a tertiary ICU. The Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine is making some attempts, but it's not yet there. And the number of ICU beds available is disproportionately low to the population that we have. Having said all that, I'm only going to focus on two things in the next few minutes. And one is the need for training and some kind of certification for physicians and nurses, and also continuing education on an ongoing basis to really manage emergencies. And how are we going to address the low doctor density ratio that we don't have enough trained in intensivists? And I would suggest some models that have worked elsewhere and are beginning to work here as well. And the number one is tele-ICU, tele-critical care. Basically, in tele-ICU, what we do is, from the command center, we can assist hospitals 24-7 by covering remotely, having remote monitoring systems 
having video cameras installed in each of the ICU beds where we can continuously look at the monitor, track the vital signs, uh, make decisions based on that, contact the bedside nurse, and also have the bedside nurse have options of, as you can see, the button there have what we call e-alerts, where they can alert the command center and get immediate help from qualified, uh, qualified intensive care doctors. More importantly, it certainly helps to establish evidence-based practice, uh, having these best practices built into the softwares and the systems, it gives alerts both from the command center and for um, the hospital bedside to ensure that the care is um, standardized. How remote is remote monitoring? As you can see from the pictures, that we uh, it somewhat looks like the Telerad Center, but I sit in front of you know 12 monitors. And it can get really remote. We are actually providing remote monitoring critical care for the US from Chennai. So it is certainly possible to provide remote monitoring support. Um, and there are several ready-to-use softwares that are available. And these were created by intensivists for intensive care and therefore are very tuned to tracking vital signs, giving us the kind of alerts we need on how, how, how old are the lines, when should the line come out, what are the new you know, blood cultures or reports that have come in. And of course, significantly integrating imaging solutions because we are able to access the images in a second, maybe interpreted by Dr. Arjun Kalyanpur from the other side of the country, but through the US. Um, so there have been a um, significant number of uh, hospitals in the U.S. that are beginning to use it. And there was this report from the Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts Technology Collaborative saying that clearly tele-ICUs are saving lives. It reduced the mortality by about 20% and the total hospital mortality was reduced by about 13%. More importantly, it shortens the length of stay. And about 30% of the length of stay, uh, average length of stay or adjusted length of stay was reduced, which saves significant amount of money. And as you can see, both academic centers and smaller community centers are beginning to adapt this uh, with more savings at the community centers, but certainly at the academic medical centers as well. And the community hospitals are beginning to understand that they can treat more patients because of improved efficiency. Proven model in the U.S., we are you know, taking care of this from India, and we are soon going to start similar services for the Indian hospitals. Shifting gears, I mean, as something to learn from aviation. Um, simulation has been something that the aviation medicine has used, I'm sorry, uh, aviation industry has used for a while, um, and that has really helped them achieve Six Sigma levels. And sadly enough, there's hardly any healthcare process that is close to Six Sigma. And that is something that can change and probably if we change our training methodology. And I'm going to move on to using uh, simulation-based um, uh, training methods. There are various simulators that are available for uh, training uh, in emergencies because during an emergency, we cannot be training because it's going to cost a life. And therefore, if we can provide an environment where they can practice at ease and make any number of mistakes and, you know, for lack of a better term, kill the mannequin any number of times, it would certainly make a difference when they really have to handle it at the bedside. Partial task trainers, several kind of computer-based systems, simulated patient environments, um, the newer generation 3G integrated simulators are all available for training. And the number of simulation-based training centers has been increasing all over the world. And as you can see, uh, almost about 300 centers over the world. And we started the first one in 2007 in India called TACT Academy for Clinical Training. And now there are almost about 10 simulation-based um, healthcare training centers all over the country. And it certainly makes a significant impact on how we train people for emergencies. Why should we use simulation? I mean, when you use traditional tools, particularly at the bedside, Patients get variable, I'm sorry, the candidates get variable exposure and the feedback may not be standardized. They may not know what are the consequences of bad decisions and mistakes can really be expensive. And there's a lot of issues about safety concerns and seeing one, doing one and teaching one really does not work. 
and uh, human simulation training has surely been shown to uh, make a difference. Trainees have uh, said that in several of the studies that uh, are projected there. I'm just going to quickly close with this one uh, graph where it was shown with using simulation that a lot of the times trainees perceive that they are competent but they are actually incompetent. So basically they are in the stage of unconsciously incompetent. And subsequently, as they went through the training process, they move to being consciously incompetent. That's the first step. And then move to being consciously competent. But really, our target is to get them to a stage where they can be unconsciously competent. And that's what simulation aims to achieve as we train particularly in small groups and focusing it based on the needs. And a lot of soft skill training can as also be done, particularly in critical care where patient safety aspects, crisis management skills, all of those can be taught using uh, simulation-based uh, technology. So I'll close there. I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. But I do and I understand. And that was from Confucius. And truly, we can all learn a lot from dummies. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to our next speaker, who is my co-chair, uh, Dr. Sendilvale, who is going to uh, speak on Dr. Watson, clinical assistant in a, hand, uh, in a handheld format. He is uh, SME and Solutions Lead uh, for Healthcare and Public Sector from IBM, India Software Lab in Bangalore. He has over 17 years of professional experience in various areas like public health monitoring, clinical informatics, clinical data management and mining, pharmacological studies on novel antibiotics, and bioprocess development for biopharmaceuticals. Look forward to hearing from That was pretty interesting. Um.